I have been to numerous conventions over the recent years, with my very first one being the Belfast Comic Con at the tail end of 2014, the one that was sort of around Halloween time, I believe. They have fluctuated in size and scale, but have only really been within the sphere of Comic Con so far, with the only exception being Dimensions 2016, a convention which hasn't aged well for me personally but still had some amazing moments, such as the incredible find of the mythic Doctor Who charity novel Times Champion for only £20, which was amongst another seven copies of it as David J. Howe had did an extended print run of the book and had decided to try and flog the remaining copies of said print run for quite cheap at the convention. 2018 saw the first convention outing of Doctor Fox, at the disappointing early on Belfast Comic Con comparatively, which was then followed by the incredible Dublin Comic Con in August of that year, where he ended up meeting a friend called Hink. In 2019, my opportunity for going to Belfast Comic Con in the early legs of these 12 months was squandered thanks to a family event. However, my plans for conventions weren't ending there. I had plans to return to Dublin later on in August, but the unexpected led to what was possibly the greatest convention, Birmingham Comic Con 2019. From meeting Team Drew, heaps of merchandise, furry celebrities, to celebrities being introduced to furries, this was most certainly a day to remember. Harry Williams have been good friends on YouTube for numerous years now. We have watched each other's content for ages and have even collaborated via live streams a handful of times. Us eventually meeting was an inevitability and it was during this day that it finally happened. We had originally attended to meet beforehand at um, the EM Kong of Nottingham which was happening earlier in 2019 which had the guest appearance of the amazing David Bradley. Ultimately, this didn't happen and we continued discussing possible con outings for a good while and came to a strong likelihood that Birmingham 2019 would be our meet. For a good while, it was firmly said that this was going to happen, but then Harry said he had plans for going to the second London Comic Con of 2019 and that he wasn't going to Birmingham anymore, which then got reverted a couple weeks before the con was due to take place and the meet happened. After flying over from Belfast City to Birmingham, getting a taxi ride by a clueless driver neither my dad or I could understand, we eventually arrived at the con. Harry shortly appeared afterwards, as well as Joe who arrived not so shortly afterwards after going to the wrong place a couple hours in. When we met up, I ended up gifting Harry with something. The legendary YouTuber TJ Productions recently has been shifting and selling large amounts of his Doctor Who collection, and I was able to buy his Doctor Who Telos novella Deluxes. I almost didn't have any of these deluxe books already, and quite a few of the novellas were thin, so I decided to go for the bundle. The only would-be duplicate in the bundle would be the Time and Relative Deluxe book, and I ended up giving Harry this spare copy as I had been making him interested about the book for a while. We then walked around a bit and chatted, sharing our excitement about the con and our confusion of where to go for a ticket. After pacing about for a bit, we eventually found they had to go into a completely separate building to where the con was being held and buy the tickets in there, which was pretty weird and kind of stupid in my opinion. After solving the puzzle of how to gain entry, we were in and loved it. With Joe eventually joining us, we wandered round and just soaked up the atmosphere, looking at the vast and numerous stalls of varying merchandise and tons upon 
upon tons of autographic collectibles. Whether it be a fully signed frame display of the Rolling Stones, the similar one of Jimi Hendrix, the piles of, of guests, both TV, film and even sports signatures, the thousands of pre-signed autographs, to even a giga-rare Peter Cushing display of his movie Doctor with his autograph, wish I had taken a photo of that. And the picture seeing on screen now isn't the one I saw, but it's extremely similar to the one I saw at the same time with the exact same picture being used. Now, with regards to the guests, me and Harry had booked to go on Saturday, and it was only after those organisations we realised how split across they were on both of the days. Unfortunately, because of them going on Sunday, I was not able to get a triple signed Lost in Time box set by Fraser Hines and Peter Purvis. Neither was I able to meet Arthur Darville and Richard Franklin because of this. The guests also had some unfortunate stuff as well. When queuing up with Harry for one of the guests, I think maybe Mark Strickson, a random person in the line asked me, Is Paul Darrow here? I responded with something along the lines of, yes, he's meant to be here, I'm sure he's around somewhere. Little did I know this was going to be a spooky exchange of words for reasons that I could not have seen coming. Paul ended up being a cancelled guest and sadly passed away on the Monday after the weekend that the con took place. With regards to Doctor Who, he played Captain Hawkins in Doctor Who and the Silurians and Maylin Tecker in Time Lash. I was also known for numerous other roles, such as Kurt Avon in Blake 7. Unfortunately, the convention deaths didn't stop there. During the creation of this script, it was announced also sadly that Rutger Hauer, who played Roy Batty in the original Blade Runner, a guest that the con I was hoping to meet, who was also cancelled, has died as well. Rest in peace, Paul Darrow and Rutger Hauer. You will be missed. Despite what the guest roster was throwing at us, the Saturday still had some good guests attending that I did meet. I ended up getting my DVDs of Vengeance on Varos, signed by Colin Baker, and Survival signed by Sophie Aldred, two lovely and very friendly guests, although it was hard to get a hold of Colin as almost every time I tried going up to his table to get Varos signed, he wasn't there. It took about four attempts until I could get the opportunity. I also ended up getting the five doxes signed by Mark Strickson, another lovely guest I got chatting to a little bit about the story. He recalled how he ended up meeting Patrick Troughton on set and how Pat shared a flask of whiskey with him that he took on set. He was such a lovely guest and very friendly and I just loved the story he had about one of my favourite stories. Earlier I mentioned how I was hoping to get a try signed Lost in Time box set at the convention. Peter and Fraser I unfortunately could not get to sign it as they were on a different day to me. However, I did end up meeting the other 60s guests I was hoping to meet and ended up getting a set signed by the wonderful Wendy Padbury. However, we do not stop there with autographs with this guest. I also ended up getting the War Games and, my at the time, triple signed the Invasion booklet signed by her as well, which now has Ian Fairburn, Nicholas Courtney and Sally Faulkner on it. And I would love to get Fraser to sign it someday because, oh boy, would that be a special thing to have. Padbury was without question the guest I was most excited to meet. It is no secret that I love 1960s Doctor Who. I have said it hundreds upon hundreds of times by now on the channel. As such, to meet yet another star from the era was just simply amazing to me. Zoe, as well, is a fantastic companion and is definitely one of my favourites from 1960s Doctor Who. The chemistry of hers and the Doctor's is just simply fantastic and really brought an interesting and captivating edge to season 6. 
I just love all of the conversations they have with one another about technology in the series. It's just fantastic. Wendy was probably the guest highlight of the whole convention for me. Extremely friendly overall, and she was grateful for the compliments I gave her acting, and was simply lovely to talk to. As you would probably expect, we were far from the last guests to meet her at the convention, but I don't think she could have expected who she was going to meet next. Behind us in the line was a furry, and yes, they went up to meet her, which resulted in this photo I took capturing her surprise. With regards to this bizarre community, this toucan wasn't the only one I stumbled across. In fact, this con was actually the first time I got to meet some of these chaps in full suit. Again, sorry for not knowing the character name, but thank you to Harry Williams for taking my photo with this cutie, who was among a pack of furries, that I couldn't get a photo with as the heat was getting to the mall. I also ended up getting an awesome selfie with Bass and Flames, a beauty of the base, after chasing after them for a considerable time as they were just running around being mad and really, really fucking cute. After walking around for a good while, me, Harry and Joe eventually sat down at a Wetherspoons cafe and just talked about numerous things and reflected on the convention and our time at it. It was just wonderful to sit down and to talk to one another after so many years of online contacts, to get to know one another a bit more, talk about Series 11, the show as a whole, it was simply wonderful and it led to so many interesting moments like um, I think we were talking about the new Doctor Who and Joe brought up um, the point of how weeping angels reproduce because they can't look at each other which led to the pun of being rock hard and a very interesting conversation about how weeping angels even reproduce which we didn't come to any solid conclusions for. But for many reasons I would say that this has probably been my best convention experience yet. From the pantheon of merchandise the gay pat, jaw dropping autograph rarities, the walking furballs, to the wonderful guests was all part of the fun of the convention. But what really made it for me was meeting Harry Williams. We have gotten on so well with each other over the years and this was no exception. Us meeting and just walking around and chatting was such an awesome thing to do and it really made the convention for me simply magical. Hello what is up YouTube? I know this isn't kind of the normal video I kind of do, I normally do like Minecraft or something like that. Um, but in the spirit of the new Doctor Who um, episode or series which was aired last night, um, that I couldn't be able to, that I wasn't, that I wasn't able to watch because I <coughs> was at a cinema watching a movie called Good Vibrations which I thought was really good. But anyway, in the spirit of the new Doctor Who series, I think I should show you my entire Doctor Who DVD collection. I have been in the Doctor Who YouTubing community for quite a while now. I first uploaded a Doctor Who video back in March 2013, and I have enjoyed making videos on the show ever since. Recently, I have started to shift over into the territories of being a more of a science fiction critical discussion furry YouTuber with a firm rooting in Doctor Who, mainly because I'm a bit sick and tired of the Doctor Who community. In a way, I'm forever cursed with being a part of the fandom as I am most definitely still a fan of the show. But the thing is, over recent years, I've just found corners of it cancerous and it's just so much is wrong with the Doctor Who community in this current I don't know, status quo would you call it? I mean, TJ Productions recently did a video about his stance in the Doctor Who fandom about how like everybody is just so ready to hate uh, Jodie Whittaker's Doctor just because of female docs and what have you. It's, it's just that there's a load of Doctor Who uh, stuff in the community and members that I'm just growing extremely sick and tired of and 
the fandom is just quite cancerous at this time in my opinion. There's just so much to the Doctor Who community that can be hated right now. I'm just sick and tired of it. And the same thing can be really said of the WhoTube community, which kind of branches over and sort of crosses over quite a bit, as you would expect. The only ones I would really watch would be Poe Smith 11, TJ Productions and Harry Williams Productions. It's a community that I was heavily a part of at one point, but I don't really consider myself involved with much anymore, even though I still do like uploading Doctor Who videos. Implementing the furry fandom into the mixture of my content and creating what I called, at the time, a Furvian, combination of furry and whovian, YouTuber, was me trying to break away from the Doctor Who YouTube community and the Doctor Who community a bit, and also in order to try and make videos on a community I had also found interesting. However, in 2019 I decided to branch out even more this time into the world of non-Doctor Who books. I have also recently been getting into non-Doctor Who TV shows, a small selection of which I may be reviewing at some point on the channel, as well as the non-Doctor Who books, one of which is going to be showcased later on, as well as another that I won't be reviewing. All of this started the year prior, however, and slowly built up to what it is today, and this here is the book that started it all. Do androids dream of electric sheep? Or, as you would more commonly know it, Blade Runner by Philip K. Dick. Back in 2018, I went on holiday and picked up a few things, one of which was this book, and I started to read it on the holiday and finished it back at home. This was the first of many books of, of the non-Doctor Who realms that I started to buy and collect this year, mainly of the science fiction areas. It was actually on a random whim that I decided to buy this book and read it, as at this point I had a huge love for the movie Blade Runner 2049, a sequel to the movie Blade Runner of which this book is based off. It was one of my favourite movies of all time in 2018, Blade Runner 2049, and I was very curious about seeing the origins of it. It was quite a while ago that I read this now, obviously, and I honestly can't remember much about it, but I do recall it being alright. It is one book that I would like to come back to one day and reread it to see if I can appreciate it more. I think at this point, whereas it was an interesting glimpse into one of my favourite movies, I think I enjoyed it only enough to give it a 6 out of 10. World War Terminus have left the Earth devastated. Through its ruins, bounty hunter Rick Deckard stalked in search of the renegade replicants who were his prey. When he wasn't retiring them with his laser weapon, he dreamed of owning a live animal, the ultimate status symbol in a world all but perfect of animal life. And Rick got his chance. The assignment to kill six Nexus 6 targets for a huge reward, but in Deckard's world, things were never that simple, and his assignment quickly turned into a nightmare kaleidoscope of subterfuge and deceit, and the threat of death for the hunter rather than the hunted. Hopefully with a bit more experience with sci-fi books and newer found appreciation of the original movie, more on that later on, I'll come back around to this book and like it much more than I did. Maybe it wasn't a good starting point for me to branch out, and maybe I should have started with some HD Wells, but it did get me curious about and into reading non-Doctor Who books. Keep in mind by this time that I had read Blade Runner, I had only been reading nothing but Doctor Who books for about four and a half years by this point. Seeing as there was quite a few of his books under the SF Masterworks range of books at my local HMV under the deal of two for five pounds, I ended up getting more of his books. Thanks to this and a couple other sources, I have since bought another seven Philip K. Dick books, which I won't be showing today, but later on in a collection video. 
after this event I continue to read non-Doctor Who books, but still primarily ones based off the show. It wasn't until 2019 however that changed and it was almost the opposite of what it was. Recently I have not only been buying more and more sci-fi TV shows, but also quite a few non-Doctor Who books, mainly on a range that this segment will be focusing on. The publisher of this movie tie-in of the book is Galansk, whom are mostly known for the making of the aforementioned SF Masterworks range of books. It is a range which is dedicated to keeping in print not necessarily the best, but the most important science fiction books from what I can gather. Mostly in paperback, but rarely in hardback as well, accompanied by some truly stunning artwork. I currently have a total of 19 from this range, and in these middle episodes of this Birmingham Comic Con video event, I shall be showcasing 7, as well as a further singular instalment when we go into the merchandise of the convention part of this video. The other 11 are just going to have to wait for another video. Three of these I bought online, one from an Oxfam bookshop, one from my local Waterstones, and the other two utilising that aforementioned HMV 2 for 5 deal. Starting off this stack, we have a pretty old but famous novella that has infected generations upon generations pretty much. That is none other than the iconic The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. 2019 was the first year of me reading quite a few authors for myself, Stephen King, Dean Koontz, but more importantly here, H.G. Wells. Back in 2018, I picked up a fat case CD edition of Jeff Wayne's musical adaptation of The War of the Worlds. For quite a while, that was actually my favourite album of all time, and I greatly enjoyed playing The Eve of the War on my way to work so many goddamn times. Partially thanks to that and my ever-growing appetite for more non-sci-fi Doctor Who books, this led me to reading the original novella as well as The Invisible Man in 2019, both of which I enjoyed greatly, particularly Invisible Man which I would give a 9 out of 10. I had managed to get a lot of his famous sci-fi novels pretty quick, but I somehow didn't end up getting the obvious one, The Time Machine, until recently. Haven't read this yet but I am most definitely interested in doing so and would like to review it at some point on the channel. At first, the far future looks like an enchanting place to the time traveller. The graceful Eli appear to embody contentment, beauty and peace, and the Eden they live in seems to be free of suffering, but he soon comes to understand that the Eli are fragile creatures, desperately afraid of the dark, and with good reason. For the Morlocks live in the dark, and the Morlocks are to be feared, and the time traveller must venture into their subterranean world to find his way back to his own era. Next up we have I Am Legend by Richard Matheson. Years ago now, I actually remember watching the movie with Latot as the lead role with my dad, and I remember pretty vividly being upset by the ending scene. I think I've heard mixed feelings about this book overall with regards to the general consensus, but nonetheless it is one I'm still pretty excited about venturing into and giving a shot. Robert Neville is the last living man on earth, but he is not alone. Every other man, woman, and child on the planet has become a vampire, and they are hungry for Neville's blood. By day, he is the hunter, stalking undead through the ruins of civilization. By night, he barricades himself in his home and prays for the dawn. How long can one man survive like this? Next up, we have the two I managed to obtain via the HMV 2 for 5 deal. The Body Snatchers by Jake Finney and Flowers for Alaganon by Daniel Keyes. Again, both of these books sound absolutely fantastic, with Snatchers probably being my next read after the 550 page Stephen King monolith that I'm currently reading. Flowers sounds like a really unique and even psychedelic read that I'm also interested in reading, that has a great sounding premise, and the other just sounds like it's going to be a great Invasion of Earth story. 
the body snatchers. When Becky Driscoll turns up at Dr. Miles Bendel's consulting rooms after hours one August evening and tells him that her cousin Wilma doesn't think that her uncle Ira is really her uncle Ira, this is just the beginning of a nightmare for the sleepy town of Mill Valley. As the number of similar stories multiplies, Miles discovers the horrific truth. Aliens are taking over the bodies and minds of his friends and neighbours. Flowers for Algernon Charlie Gordon, IQ 68, is a floor sweeper and the gentle butt of everyone's jokes. Until an experiment in the enhancement of human intelligence turns him into a genius. But then Algernon, the mouse whose triumphal experimental transformation preceded his fate and dies, and Charlie has to face the possibility that his salvation was only temporary.